Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Maximum Mom podcast. And Happy New Year. It's pretty exciting. This is our first time coming to you in the new year. First, I just want to say thank you to my guest, Nashe Clark, for joining me. Thanks so much for joining me today. You're absolutely welcome. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm so excited. Well, first, I want to introduce you to our audience because you bring such a unique perspective. Obviously, as you know, we're usually a bunch of lawyers, entrepreneurs, and moms, and I love that you're not. <laughs> so it makes me so happy. Nishe Clark is founder and owner of NBC Consulting, a market research and strategy planning company. She has been in business since 2002. She has provided insights and analysis for customers in pharmaceuticals, consumer packaged goods, media and entertainment, and financial services. Ms. Clark's experience spans from the most elite advertising agencies, such as Leo Burnett, um, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, Pfizer, Procter & Gamble, and many, many more. I have so many questions for you <laughs> about market research. Thanks again for joining us and bringing us your expertise today. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. I always like us to start with, let's just get out the really important part. Tell us what makes you a mom? Who's in your family? What are you navigating at home? Okay. So I have two children. Uh, my 15-year-old daughter, who is about to turn 16, and my call before this was Sweet 16 planning. Um, <laughs> and my 11-year-old boy, who turns 12 in two weeks. Oh, and wow. And so those are my two. I've also got a half share on a bonus kid with my significant other, who actually is the exact same age as my son. Their birthdays are nine days apart. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. I love that you are in the throes of, you know, that teen time. I mean, preteen and teen, but wow. Kudos. Absolutely. It's, it's been an interesting few years around here. Oh girl, I can't even, I mean, I can't imagine obviously having done it, but wow. Yes. Um, and you are in the throes of it. And so, I mean, we're going to have to check in with you again, because obviously as that, those boys get a little older, I mean, all things will change for sure. I'm hoping he, he comes calmer again as he gets older. Oh, well, good luck with that. I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm definitely, I have um, a 26 and a 23 year old and neither of them showed um, family calm over the holidays. We'll have to talk about that privately sometime, but wow. I was like, <laughs> I thought you guys were supposed to outgrow this stuff at some point. I put rules in place for this holiday because mama needed a break. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. We should talk about that though. We should talk about boundaries and rules because boy, is that something we moms really need more of? It's a and struggle. It's and just, a just struggle. saying no to anything in life. And then when it's your kids and then it is I want them to be happy. Struggle. I keep telling my kids, I want you to be happy, but I also now say, and I want you to be okay. Exactly. Because there's so many different pressures, you know, both of my kids have ADHD. And so there's, you know, that piece as well. And I want them to learn how to become functional adults, sometimes mm -hmm. meaning you're not going to be happy in the moment, right. but it's hard as a mom. Cause I, you know, I just want to sprinkle fairy dust and take them to Disneyland. So it is, I find that to be the hardest thing. And now kind of being on the you know, the, the back end of this, looking at young adult kids, six of them and seeing, I mean, the kids that I was able to really hold more accountable. And what I mean by that isn't necessarily, you know, like, here's this thing I'm holding you accountable. It's was stepping out of the way and letting those natural consequences of life kind of slap them in the face. When I was able to do that more consistently, that child has truly learned and internalized lessons better than when I was maybe in my earlier years of parenting more, you know, trying to kind of sprinkle that fairy dust and make things okay. And I think as time went on, I came to really appreciate, I mean, stepping out of the way is probably as important as the fairy dust, you know? Yes. 
Absolutely. The natural consequences thing is amazing. I actually went to a couple of parenting workshops um, and I was never a self-help kind of person, but I, I was hitting the wall with both kids and trying to figure out what was going to work with them. Yep. And um, I, you know, I went to, and it, it spun my head around because, you know, just thinking about like neurodiversity and, you know, the pliability of the brain at this age and all the different things that we can do to help our kids to learn and grow. And then the natural consequences pieces, right. they diagnosed us all as parents. So I was the over-functioner. Yep. Me too. <laughs> so, you know, I was stepping in too much and I've had to learn how to step back, even if that means sitting on my hands sometimes and grinning yep. and bearing it. But Knowing that that is what's going to help them grow in the long run, even though I'm feeling their pain, maybe more than they're feeling their own. Totally. Well, you're able to see a lot of these like explosions about to happen. You know, you can almost chart the path of problems, but they can't. And it's right. fascinating to be able to step back and really help them think through it. I mean, one of the things that I have found so, so powerful is really modeling, like, how do you think through a problem? Because I too have kids, a lot of them with ADHD and really stepping back and taking that time. And I should say, I probably have ADHD undiagnosed, but, um, I'm I know. I keep wondering now, you know, late in life, like, have I just been really super high functioning? And is that why I like to do so many different things? And I'm a really good multitasker. Yeah. <laughs> That's how oh, I yeah. To compensate. Totally possible. Oh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's absolutely possible. And I think really modeling with your children, like, how do you think through future decision making, you know, in getting over some of that impulsivity and that inability to kind of you know, see the the forest and see the trees and be able to to do that thinking and then help them when you see some of these crises developing, reminding them, you know, using whatever your language is to be like, you know, this is a great time for you to step back and think, but not you, mom, do the thinking. You know what I mean? Right. Letting them right. use those the future muscles. planning thing is tough. That was a tough one for me because I am a future planner. Um, oh, you know, the joke too. with my friend said is Nashay's always got a plan A, plan B, plan C, and there's probably a few more back there that she's yep. just not going to let on to. And mm -hmm. even as a young child, and I think my mother instilled that in me, you know, I, I picked my career at 12. I started interning at 14, you know, and it just, you know, and I, I can always see, okay, what's next? What's next? Like, you know, if you watch the West Wing and, and you know, President Bartlett, they go into the room and they're trying to keep talking to him. And he's like, what's next? That's me because I've already thought three steps ahead. And when you have kids that don't have future planning right. skills in their cognitive toolbox right now, you know, I, I didn't understand them. I was like, how do you parent kids if you, if I can't tell you, okay, in five years, you're not going to get into college because of, you know, right. knuckleheaded stuff you're doing now. And they're like, what's five years? I don't know what five years is, yeah. you know, feels good right now. And who cares about that was, that was a lot for me to figure out. Yeah. Well, and it, it has been fascinating for me. I mean, I like you, I mean, you and I are so similar, just like go, go, go. I'm always, you know, miss go, go girl. And I assumed, of course, all six of these children would go to college and do whatever. It has been really eye-opening to sit with my kids. And I mean, really sit with some of them at pretty young ages where they're like, I could care less about college right now. <laughs> my goal is, you know, to be the best offensive lineman in the state of Washington on a football team. And I'm thinking... Um, I'm like, okay, but I mean, really trying to sit with that and understand like, that's, what's going to drive that child. That child is going to be driven by going to every football practice, by attending every practice, right. being able to play in every game, doing well in every game. Like I can push and push and push on the grades all I want. It's not going to work. Like right. that. I have to be happy in this other aspect of themselves. Exactly. I always say that 
you've got to have, you know, you got to figure out how to triangulate your kids, right? So, you know, for mine, it's, it's, um, you know, my big girl, she's a writer. So it's kind of the literary function, you know, that we make sure that we're dug into in school. It's sports. She pay, plays very competitive lacrosse. And that could be, you know, kind of a yeah. future college situation. And then art, this is her art behind me, which is funny wow. because, she doesn't think she's that great. And everyone's like, why is she not showing? Right. <laughs> you know, and I keep reminding, it's almost a reminder to me to remind her, embrace your talents, right. lean into talent and, and let it take you where it takes you. Exactly. And if you have multiple areas of talent, they will probably fold back into each other into some yeah, way. For sure. I was always a good writer and a good speaker. And my mother said, okay, well, how do you make a living doing that? Literally, right. that was it. And I said, oh. And so then first I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to write novels. And my mother said, that's nice, dear. But not everyone gets to become a novelist. Go pick right. a career and write a novel at night. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that was kind of what led me into advertising and marketing and eventually kind of the insights and the research part of the marketing that really tickled me and, and, wow. you know, yeah. just looking at all of those pieces and how if you find a piece of yourself that has a talent that you can be passionate about, see what it can circle around to take you to. Completely. I don't know if you've heard of a book. I mean, you might probably have. It's written by Eve Rodsky called Find Your Unicorn Space. It no, is, that's a new one. Oh, you would love it. And you probably would want to gift it to your daughter. It is. <laughs> so powerful in helping you understand kind of the value of those things like art that she loves and does great at and how you can use that unicorn space in so many different ways and, and sharing it with the world. I mean, and I'm not saying sharing it with the world has to be monetizing it. I don't mean that at all. Right. It can be all kinds of different things, but wow, was that a powerful read for me? Um, yeah, I would recommend you checking it out. It's called Finding Your Unicorn Space by Eve Rodsky. And it really is game changing. Wow. Really okay. Changing. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I mean, you and I, could, gosh, we could talk for hours about these children and mom things because wow, is it so, I have found being a mom to be the most humbling journey of my entire life. Absolutely. Yay. I'm like, well, damn, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> like, whoa, what I thought would work did not work. And, right. Or just the reality of like, just what I think seemed reasonable and a good path. I'm like, who am I to decide my child's path in any way? Like, that is not my role. You know what I mean? Like, my. Well, role you have to let them grow. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and for me, I, you know, I'm more than a bit type A and the humbling aspect for me from a parenting standpoint was, was the fact that I couldn't fix it. I couldn't right. power my way into something because with everything else, career, you know, outside interests, running organizations, I've always had a confidence because I've usually been able to pull it off that if I just work hard at it, I'll right. get it. And I'll get it right. And I'm very decisive. And then suddenly I'm in this situation where I don't know what to do. I'm trying to make decisions. And I realize more and more that I'm not sure of my oh. own decision making anymore. I yeah. mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, kind of a mental health crisis for me to think, oh, yeah. what am I doing? I don't know how to do this. There's not a, you know, I, I can't go to business school for this and just, okay. you know, get kind of a template. And, and I remember sitting out outside of a school, I was, you know, picking schools for middle school for my daughter and, you know, everything was kind of not working and I was trying to figure things out. And I went to the school and I was like, this is where my kid belongs. This is where my kid belongs. And I, I got in the car and I cried. Because it was the first time in a while that I had that moment that I'm used to living with. Right. Clarity. The, that's it moment. This is the decision. I'm not questioning it one iota. 
Yeah. And it's been so long since I had a moment like that as a parent that I just sat in the car outside the school and cried for a bit, like just totally. the relief oh. of it. Oh my gosh. I cannot, I mean, I cannot tell you how much I hear you and see you in that. I mean, I had a child who we ended up sending to boarding school. I mean, long story, but wow, was that a tough, tough decision for me. And I very much, he was old enough where I was like, I can't make this decision for you. I'm like, you have to want this and you have to understand why I think it's the right thing for you. And, you know, and so, I mean, I was going back and forth, you know, really struggling. And one day he just texted me and he's like, I'm going, I'm ready, sign me up. I want to start. In that moment, when I got that text, literally everything fell in place. And I was just yeah. like, I have no idea how I'm paying this $60,000. Right. right. But, but the relief of I'm it all, you're like, I'll figure out. that part out later. Right. I was like, <laughs> that decision has been out. made. And it, it literally made all the difference. That drama of back and forth, wondering what's right, what's not right. Knowing I was never going to force that issue, thinking right. that would be more harmful to him than the benefits. But also knowing that, you know, he's got to want to do this. This is a 16, 17 year old kid. Like he can't, right. you know, they have to I mean. be invested in their life. Oh, absolutely. And in their future and teaching them to be invested in their future is critical, like oh. helping your children <laughs> understand. And I mean, that was those conversations sitting in the car, you know, like, I don't care about whether I get an A in this school or a B, like I want to be the best lineman. I was like, then go be the best lineman. Like that's right. what's moving you. And because of that, you're going to go to class because you can't go right. play in a football game. If you exactly. don't go to class, you, you can't be great enough to stay on the team. I was like, all right, you know, so maybe you're a B student. Okay. I mean, big deal. Like go right. and do what moves you. And I think as a parent, being able to step back from anything we think, you know, that they all do need to go to college or they all need to do this certain thing or go to this type of college or have this type of job. It has been absolutely humbling to watch some of my children like step out of the college path and be like, I'm not really into it right now. I'm going to go work. And at first you're like, um, that is not what you're supposed to be doing. Like, we all go to college in this family and graduate right. school. Like, what are we thinking? But I'm like, you know, me paying for college and you not being into it, that doesn't make much sense either. You know, right. from a, any kind of practical standpoint, I'm like, go learn the good value of a dollar and go take care of yourself. You know, you're not living on my sofa, but, um, you know, go for it. And that has been wildly eye opening to watch children, you know, take different paths, sometimes circuitous, but, right. you know, it is. Yeah, I find parenting to be so humbling and to listen to you talk about going to see and do some parenting coaching. I think that is so powerful that somebody like you who is admittedly a type A plus personality to look to a coach and realize that you could use some kind of some more tools in your own tool be belt. Yeah. I mean, how would you describe coaching? Was that powerful for you in your moving forward with your kids? Um. 100%. So, you know, I went to some workshops partially because I was trying to understand kind of the neurodiversity piece because that wasn't familiar to me. Ironically, um, you know, I, I have a lot of healthcare clients and mental health was also part of my space and I'm sitting here, but you know, like I know how to sell a drug for it. <laughs> what happens when, you know, you have to understand, you know, okay, my kid is a little anxious. What does right. that actually mean? not from a medication standpoint, but from a parenting standpoint. Totally. Um, so, and for me, having a lean towards science from that perspective, and this workshop did a great job of doing all the science for me. So then it made sense. Wow. Yeah. And then I could believe in it because it didn't sound like just, you know, touchy feely mm -hmm. jumbo. Right. It's like, no, this section of the brain controls this. When you yep. get this pace to the amygdala, like that's what get that gets that response. I'm like, I can understand that. Right. Um, and then parenting the child you have and oh. not just yes. staying in the framework because neither of my kids could survive the way I was parented. And my mother wasn't abusive or anything, but she was hard driving and, you know, it was constantly, you know, and, and my childhood was a little bit of what's next, what's next. Right. I can't do that to my kids. 
I have to, you know, pull back ask them the question, be a little warmer and fuzzier, you know, or, and then kind of put the, put the hard wheels on. I always say my kids need a hug and a foot shoved up their butt kind of simultaneously. And, you know, and learning that that's okay. That's how these kids need to be parented Mm -hmm. and learning that if you learn your kid, if you learn the way your, their mind thinks if yep. you learn where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are, then it, it just makes all the difference. You know, like my son doesn't have the greatest short-term memory. Now he can, he will describe a conversation verbatim, you know, from five years ago, but in the house, if I say, you know, Hey, go, you know, go put your clothes away. And if he's in the middle, you know, and then I, I, I was yelling or frustrating or why is this kid not listening to me and then it actually turned out it he actually did just forget in the moment so I changed my parenting honey will you put your clothes away Uh uh-huh what did mama tell you put my clothes away okay so when are we going to do that well I'm going to do that in 15 minutes what are we going to do in 15 minutes I'm going to put my clothes away yeah and that you know kind of three points in which he had to indicate put my clothes away helped that transition into the right part of his brain so that it could then be stored and accessed. Uh, So instead of yelling at him for not putting his clothes away, I just know, okay, I need to repeat it. I need to review it. And then I need to have him sign off on it with a plan. It is, I mean, to talk about powerful yet so simple to parent the child you have, lead the people you have. I mean, all... I literally had the most like aha moment with my son who actually joined the military. So he was in boot camp leading some battalion. And he calls me one day and he was like, man, he goes, this parenting stuff that you've been doing with all of us, he goes, this is tricky. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, I got some kids that I need to like sit on the rack with them, like really connect with them, talk about their trauma in their life, and then be able to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it to get them to move. He goes, then I got other guys in my platoon that I need to get in their face and yell at them. They're never going to do anything if I am not in their face yelling at them. He goes, then I got others that are like rebellious as all get out. And I better explain the why to why we're doing it and why it's going to benefit them. And he goes, and if I can put all that together, they'll do whatever the thing is. He's like, but if I came to each of those three different people with whatever my natural inclination was, he goes, I would have lost at least two of them every single time. Exactly. That's, that's profound for my 20 year old to understand this. Well, and, and, it, and, it, and it works in the workplace. It does. Because if you think about, you know, who you are as a worker, who your employees are yeah. as workers, who your clients are. Yes. You know, we had an interesting scenario. I, I was working with a consultant who was consulting to me, but, you know, her boss was on right. the other side of a, di- you know, in a different organization that I had hired. And, you know, she had expressed some frustration. She would send these incredibly long emails. Um with, with rationales and all sorts of thoughts and, and feelings, feelings in the workplace, which kind of was not my jam. And, you know, and then maybe like two layers, you know, two flip pages into right. it was the actual question. And so, you know, I guess there'd been more than a few that I hadn't responded to. And so she went back to her boss and she said, I, I just want my question answered. Why isn't Nishay answering my questions? And so he said, look, let's look at this. They had just done this workshop on personality types, right? And so he said, you know, there's there's drivers and then there's like emotors. He's like, you are an emotor. You need to right. express and feel and give lots of information. Nishay is a driver. Tell me what the point is so I can get to the point and move on to the next point. So he said, why don't you send her an email and instead of two pages, three bullet points. Yep. Bullet so points. evidently she sent this email out and evidently I responded to it within two minutes. Oh my gosh. So, I love it. You know, I love she went it. back to her boss and she's like, I can't even believe that. And it was funny because he said, she, she said, well, did you call her and tell her to respond? And he said, I actually did not. And this is one of the best examples of why totally. these you know, personality archetypes in the workplace actually are meaningful and why it's important to understand who you are and who's working for you. 
Completely. You know, and I learned that, you know, I had to be a little bit more touchy feely and, right. you know, expressive and, you know, listen to, you know, things that I wasn't necessarily sure I should be listening to because that's how, you know, right. she stayed motivated. And for me, I'm like, just cut to the chase, just cut to the me? chase. I've got a lot of things on my plate. The, I mean, literally I say to my people, I'm like, bottom line it. And if you need to tell me all this other stuff, Put all that in. I'm likely not going to read it though. Just put the, the bottom line stuff at the top, kind of like an yes. executive summary. Give yes. me the bottom line, whatever question you have. And so help me, it better be a yes, no answer. Like mm -hmm. if you need some big drawn out legal analysis with starting with it depends. No, because the, don't send it to me like that. I'm like, get it where we can just answer and move on because I like you. I'm just like, Let's blow and go here. I do not have time for all this. And I can take time separate, but it's going to have to right. be like dedicated. Like I'm going to put all this in a separate bucket and I'm going to go do it. But when I'm going through a hundred things, I just need to know, what do you need to know? And let me answer it. Right. And I think, especially for us as multitasking entrepreneurs, we are looking at multiple things in the box. You're a lawyer, you're running these podcasts. You know, I run a market research and strategy business. I'm also, you know, the volunteer fundraising chair for everything that moves around town. <laughs> you know, I run my little passion bakery, like all these things. And so, yeah, I just, I just want you to give me the thing. And, and it's funny because some of my clients have responded so well to that over the years. They're like, we know that we can get right to it with the yeah. shay. And then what I found is that the folks that couldn't didn't necessarily appreciate that, I always got labeled intimidating. Oh yes. And the I I get you know, I get think, think I'm this warm, fuzzy, huggy mommy, you know, like person. And that's, you know, how I wake up in the morning, you know, <laughs> like I've given my son 22 kisses before I send, sent him to school. I sit down with my, you know, big mug that has my kids faces all over it. And, you know, and, and before any meet, you know, we're all chatting about stuff and I'm chatty chat, but then yeah, now it's work. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, no, she is very intimidating. She, you know, she, she's, she feels a little aggressive to me, you know, and that's also, you know, there's a little dog whistle a little bit in there oh, too. Yeah. Big time. And, you know, and then I know, okay, this person is not ready for strength and focus. Yeah. So I have to ratchet back the amount of strength and focus that I demonstrate because that's frightening. Do you ever talk about it? I mean, I, I love hearing this from you because I have had that label my whole life. I mean, since I was in school, I would, you know, president of this and president of that. And people would be like, she's intimidating. And I'm like, I'm the most, I think, non-intimidating human. Like, I'm like, what? Are we kidding? But I, I am coming to terms with, I need to like talk to people about it and like have very frank conversations. Like, really trying to dig in like, what is intimidating? Is it the speed right. at which I do things? Is it the language? Cause sometimes I definitely, and I am so guilty of this. I stop all the niceties of, you know, like if I send, if I'm doing a lot of emails, there won't be the, you know, good morning. How was your weekend? How's your grandma right. feeling? You know, what, what did you bake over the weekend? Like, right. I'll just be like, Hey, I need, this I need blah, 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 blah done. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we, and then some people will put in there, well, by the way, good morning, and I'm just like, oh gosh. <laughs> but, so I actually do a setup now, and I do this both personally and professionally. I also yeah. have a live in au pair, and um, you know, and every time I you know transition out, I sit them down and I say, look, I work from home. I'm on a computer all day. Sometimes I'm sitting in my office. Sometimes I just sit on my bed in the yoga position and I click, click, yeah. click away. And it may not seem like I'm super busy. That may be a different feeling for you from other jobs that you might be used to seeing your family. And so if you catch me during the course of the day, kind of just running down to the kitchen real quick to refill my tea and running back up and not stopping to chat or any of that kind of stuff, I want you to remember, never take that personally. Mm -hmm. If you see me with a serious look on my face, walking around the house, I'm not mad at you. I'm probably thinking about some conundrum that a client has given me. Right. And so 
when I can, and I can separate out, then you'll see, you know, the me that I like to imagine I am, you know, like I'm, I'm the person who's still cries at like way too many movies and right. you know, don't take me to an amusement park because you will see an entirely different side of me. I love roller coasters, you know, like all of that stuff. Right. But when I am in work mode, right. yes, my own intensity, my own need to get things accomplished is, you know, there is some intensity there and I need you to not take that personally. Right. And I say the same thing with clients It's you know, I make sure that we do the get to know you and all the good stuff. And, you know, and then there are days when I say, you know, I just want you to know, I'm really focused on making sure you get what you need today mm -hmm. and, and hope that that's enough of a signal right? <laughs> that I might not be, you know, starting the meeting with a ton of social chit chat or sending, you know, an email. And I, and I want people to know that I care about them and part of the, right. you know, the focus is actually a demonstration of how seriously I take my business and theirs. Right. Yeah. And, and then hopefully we can have drinks after we've presented, done whatever presentation that we've Right, exactly. There's and we've accomplished time. the result. I feel like as entrepreneurs, we are so focused on the result and really, you know, moving those needles forward, which need to be moved, whether it's for our clients, in our own business, I mean, often combined. And I feel like a lot of times the people on our team, they're still in that kind of like, I have a job mode, you know, like right. I'm here, I'm working, I'm getting a paycheck. It's not as result focused. Exactly. And so it is a very different level of intensity I find. And, mm -hmm. and I'm really right. trying to like balance that because I sometimes get burned out about being called intimidating. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I get a little frustrated every now and then. And then I kind of just start to lean into it. I think yeah. maybe four or five years ago, I was like, if, if this is the thing, then this <laughs> is just the thing. And at the end of the day, you know, I run a consulting business, which means that, you know, my clients pay by the hour, or by the minute or by the project deliverable. They yep. do not pay by conversations by a water cooler or, you know, kind of right. just glad handing a bunch of things. And so, you know, I just, I set things up that way. And, you know, many of my clients over the years have become friends. Um, right. Several of my former clients work for me now, you know, when they kind of tapped out of being in corporate and they just wanted to consult and not have to be stressed out. I'm like, then, you know, then, then come be in my consulting network so I can tag right. you for projects. And that's worked out really well. So I, you know, and I think, I think it's not everyone that views me and us in this dynamic, but it's a portion of a population. And there's certainly a portion that because we're women, there's an additive there. And because I'm a black woman, there's right. another additive there. And I've just recognized it, owned it. And I'm like, you know something, if that's the view you have of me, then how do I make this worth my while? Right. I mean, so exactly. if nothing else, I stand out in every room I go into. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think that's back to boundaries. I mean, figuring out how to make it work for you. I mean, somebody said something to me yesterday about learning to not disappoint ourselves first and, you know, accepting that we're going to disappoint other people. And I thought that is so interesting because I think sometimes we focus on how do we fix things, you know, to make other people comfortable. And I mean, as long as in my mind, I have this, as long as I know, like the language I'm using is respectful, professional, polite, kind, you know, right. all the things, if somebody finds me intimidating, there's only so much I can do about it. You know, I find it's usually just pace, my pace. Uh, yeah. Mine too. Sometimes you know, I can move through material quickly. I can process the information quickly. Right. So that means I've moved on to the next thing quickly. And yeah. so, yes, I modulate pace in circumstances where I know it's going to be viewed as intimidating or they simply can't keep up. And, you know, but I know that this is my pace. So when I'm sitting at home in my office or cross-legged on my bed, <laughs> I can, I can be me. Totally. And, you know, 
cruise through all of this data that I'm looking at, provide my clients with insights and expert level, you know, plans for new product development and just know that, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the perfect fit for every client out there. Right. But that's part of the reason why I stayed intentionally small. Right. I didn't want to have to carry that burden of having to be all things for all people. Right. So I run a very small boutique company and, you know, a lot of my businesses repeat. I've got, you know, a couple of people who every time they move businesses, they just bring me on there, which is great. Cause then, you know, that's yeah. brought me into a variety of different companies and, you know, then there's some folks that I'm like, you know, I might not be the best fix. I'm going to be direct. I'm going to tell you that, you know, this is what we're hearing in the marketplace. It may be different from what your original hypothesis is. And that right. might not sit well with you. You know, like you have those folks who I call it inventionism syndrome. Like if they didn't invent it, it's not good. Right. Yep. <laughs> I love that though, to think about market research. I mean, as lawyers, as you can imagine, like just I'm sure as in the medical profession and you're constantly trying to innovate and how do you think of ways to do things better, more efficiently, more client centered, you know, where you're standing out. And I mean, how do you use market research? Because I think a lot of lawyers do not participate in market research. It's all- And they should. I've had a couple, I've had a couple legal clients um, and in both cases, they won. So <laughs> I love it. What does market research look like for a legal client? Like what is, what can that look like? So for instance, in one, it was all, you know, it was kind of a, um, the company that I was working, you know, the, the legal team I was working with was representing felt like another company was using some of their attributes, you know, their product attributes that they felt they owned, right? You know, that th those were positioned simply for those products. And they said, no, 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 we've just kind of been vague and they changed some of their language around kind of, you know, as this suit was going on, it was years and years. So at some point in time, kind of towards, towards the end, the law firm brought me on and I did market research to understand perceptions, right? Because mm -hmm. if the whole point was, oh, there's no way that you could perceive that we're saying this, right. that which you own, you know, then of course, then it's not, you know, it's not a real lawsuit. Right. So we went out and we did, you know, a bunch of market research. We talked to people who had used their product, even right. people who had used both products and in gosh, it was probably about 70, 80% of the instances, this major brand attribute that the client that owned it, um, you know, had other people thought that that was the product, the, this competitive product. There wow. was so much brand confusion. Yeah. And that brand confusion, there was, you know, legal action to be held against that. So Absolutely. That's amazing. I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you know, there's defamation and libel, you know, it's, it's perception, right? You have, you know, if you're defaming someone, well, what are the characteristics of the defamation and sometimes going out and being able to um, demonstrate how people are reacting to things and right. what the, what the perception is and being able to do that in a professional manner, you know, statistically significant, if we're doing quant or qualitatively, we're able to provide verbatims or, you know, the, the quotes and, you know, documentation of the process that we went through in order to expose them to different materials. Wow. We find that it's actually been very helpful in those cases. But well, one most thing of our is, clients are pharma and financial services. Right. And well, one thing that has come up in, in my world of law, which, you know, is focused on family law, there's this big kind of debate out there on billable hour versus flat fee and people talking about how, oh, flat fee, it's too much. You know, you're, you're quoting these large things and people aren't going to pay it. And it is something that I have thought like this is an area where market research would be so valuable to understand because I think in different geographic markets, it's going to be different too, based on, you know, economic conditions and all kinds of things. But there is a certain certainty. I think many people of a certain wealth, they prefer the certainty of a flat fee because they can know in whether they're paying 50 grand for a divorce, a hundred grand for a divorce, the number almost doesn't matter. It's the, yes, certainty. the certainty of it. Absolutely. And 
you know, for myself, even, you know, between the hourly billable consulting yeah. hours and then a project fee, um, you know, and I try and skew towards project fee. And quite frankly, I hate ticking, you know, off a sheet right. at the end of the day, trying to remember which hours I put against what client. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's certainty for both of us. And I feel like yeah. it's a comfort. And they also know that um, you know, if, if things don't go the way everyone plans within, you know, kind of a five, 10% range, right. you're still covered yep. and there's comfort in knowing that, you know, this person isn't going to just run out the door on me. Right. Yeah. I just think we lawyers could use market research so much more powerfully as we're deciding what services to offer people, what we're charging for those services, you know, how we're bringing those services into people's world. Mm -hmm. Right. What the market like. can stand from a pricing perspective exactly. and what the client audience can, can tolerate. You know, because yeah. I had to even do my own market research because there was a, you know, there was one point where I was completely undercharging. And then I, you know, I kind of went out and I figured, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> completely undervalued myself. So, you know, yeah. it's applicable even within your own setting. Right. I love that. I really, really appreciate your time today. It has been so lovely talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. We're going to have to have a tea fest one time so we can chat <laughs> we about. Absolutely should. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining. And anybody who's listening, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast. And Nishé, how can people follow you, get in touch with you? Like, where would they find you? So my website, uh, www.nvcconsulting.net, um, info at nvcconsulting.net. And we are on Instagram and Facebook, NVC Consulting. So perfect. Okay. Well, we will make sure to put all that in the um, show notes so people can get in touch with you and very much good luck with everything going on with your kids. And do look up that book, Find Your Unicorn Space. And I'm going to look up your passion bakery. Because now, what is your passion bakery? Do you have a website? Uh, Comfort Cakes. Comfort okay. Cakes Bake Stop. So it's okay. Instagram and Facebook. I had to take the website down because it was, I was getting slammed with too many orders. <laughs> and, you know, and it, it kind of started, it started in COVID when I wasn't quite as busy and I'm not right. good at sitting still and everyone missed coming over because I'm always the host for everything in right. my neighborhood. So it kind of started from there and it took off. And then I had to kind of right. like, wait a minute, <laughs> back in, you know, I'm like, Pfizer is back. I can't be baking all day. So I love that. That is awesome. That is you were, at least for a time, that was your unicorn space. I it love it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Absolutely. lovely. Absolutely. Bye, Nishay. Okay. Bye-bye.